go ahead and take your Bibles this morning. We're going to go in the Word of God. We're finishing up our series on baggage, and uh, this is week four of that series, and we are going to look today specifically at the theme from woundedness to wholeness. This is actually Amy's story here, from woundedness to wholeness. I didn't realize how much this dovetailed together so well with what you just shared, so beautiful. We're going to unpack that together, and uh, let's trust God's going to speak to our hearts. Amen. Hope you have your Bible. I want you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 10. Uh, we'll look at, there's 11 verses there. We'll highlight a few of those. So if you could turn there in that way, it'd be great to see that in your Bible. Because I think you're going to want to highlight, take a pen and mark in your Bible a few things in here because it's a very rare text and there's some amazing things in here. So today's message is going to be a trip. How's that? We're, we're going to fly. We're going to live free and we're going to travel light. We're going to go on a journey from the shadows of woundedness to the heights. We're going to soar with the Lord. We're going to go places and we're going to end up in a place that's called Shalom. It's a land of Shalom, wholeness. The word Shalom is more than peace. A lot of us think of the word Shalom as only God gives us peace. But it's so much more than that. It's a place that God wants us to arrive to. Shalom means full, complete, whole, yes, and peace. It's a place of great healing where we are restored. It's an amazing place. How many people want to travel to the land of Shalom? Yes, we want to get there. So we're going to take a flight together, and this, this sermon will be a, a journey together. All right, many biblical passages talk about journeys, talk about trips, talk about moving from one place to another, and many of the biblical figures undergo epic adventures. Now, it's kind of like Lord of the Rings, the epic adventure, right? You see them journeying to get to a certain place. This is kind of like every Bible story, and Tolkien, who wrote Lord of the Rings, had this in mind when he saw all the patriarchs and stories. They all had journeys. They left something and went to another place, Moses specifically was leading his people out of the bondage of slavery in Egypt. And this epic journey took Moses as the leader, as the reluctant leader, so to speak, the one that had all kinds of excuses, didn't really want God to use him, and yet God took his life, and Moses is a great leader, took the people out of slavery and out of the baggage of a slave mentality. Because it wasn't just the land they were leaving, it was the mindsets that needed to leave in order for them to enter into the promised land that God had for them. So in Deuteronomy chapter 10, Moses is the author of this book. And throughout this book, we actually see Moses fulfilling many different roles. He's, he's uh, first of all, he is a powerful deliverer, which we, we know much of. He's a great lawgiver. We see Moses being used of God to bring the law for us to live our lives according. So he's a great lawgiver. And today, for today's message, is he's a prevailing sojourner. He knows how to travel. He knows how to move people. And my heart today is that I will move with you, and I will lead you, and we will sojourn together. Moses was also a prototype of the Messiah, of Jesus Christ, what he wants to do in all of our lives. So there's multiple levels, multiple levels of things happening in this text. Deuteronomy 10, verses 1 to 11. I'm reading from the NIV. Follow along your Bible if you have one. At that time, the Lord said to me, to Moses, chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones. Let's pause there. Remember the first ones? He was up in the mountain, the glory, and there was a sacred cow, and he got angry and smashed the tablets of the Ten Commandments. And that was the end of it. Nope. God said, eh, eh, you're going back and you're going to re-chisel some new tablets. So this is the second go at it. Tablets like the first ones come up to me on the mountain. So similar kind of experience in the glory of God. So this is where the law came from. The law came from the glory of God. So come into the glory, all right? And then once you have that, also make a wooden ark, it says, and I'll write on the tablets the words that were, were on the first tablets, which you broke, 
and then you were put them into the ark, the ark of the covenant. Raiders of the lost ark, think that. In the ark of the covenant. Now, verses three to five, we'll skip, but this is where Moses made the ark of the covenant and did whatever the Lord asked him to do. So it just kind of describes that. Verse six, we'll pick it up there. The Israelites traveled, everybody say traveled. Travel. This is where I want you to focus. Traveled from the wells of Bene Jachin to Moshera. We'll skip to the, to the next verse, verse seven there. We'll skip a little bit there. From there they traveled to Gurgauta and then to Jothbatha, a land with streams of water. Verses eight and nine. We'll just package that in one statement. It's extensive, but this is where the role of the Levites were explained, the priests that were going to come and lead people in worship, verse 8 and 9. But then verse 10, back to the people. Now I stayed on the mountain, this is Moses, 40 days and 40 nights, as I did the first time, and the Lord listened to me this time also. This is his second go at entering the presence of God, following the Lord, after he made a mistake and broke the law before, after everything that happened, God said, oh, we're going to do it. It's a mulligan. We're, we're going to reboot this story once again. And then here, you get a do-over. All right? This is important because we all need a do-over. We all need to redo some things. How many people know that God forgives you and then he forgives you and then he ends up forgiving you, right? And he for keeps on... How many people know? How many times does God forgive you? 70 times seven? He just keeps forgiving because he's so good. He keeps giving us a do-over. How, does God give second chances? Are you kidding? At least. How many have had four or five chances? Can I have six? Can I have seven? seven? Sold to the man in the back. 12 chances. All right, let's move here. As I did the first time, and the Lord listened to me this time also, it was not his will to destroy you. It's good news. Verse 11, go. Lord said to me, and lead the people on their way so that they may enter and possess the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. God's plan for Israel has always been full recovery, not partial recovery, not because man screws up that he said, oh, well, you had your chance and it's over. No, God's plan from the very beginning was to move Israel into the promised land even after the rebellion at Sinai. And it was a huge rebellion. It was like devil worship, practically. What were the people of Israel thinking? Right? It was just demonic-inspired worship of the golden calf. Like, that's pretty bad rebellion. How many would agree? That was a mistake. They screwed up big time. But as with all of us, the people of Israel, like us, we, we fall short of the glory of God. In fact, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, we use this to highlight our salvation, but the reality is, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're all in the pursuit of finding the glory of God. To be honest with you, the glory of God, we sang it this morning, it, the glory of God is what we really need. His presence is what we need. He's making us new vessels, an offering, He's doing things in us to change us, to renew us, so that we can enter into more of the glory that he has for us. But sin keeps us away. And so we don't want sin. We want his glory. So here's today's itinerary, if you're writing notes. So the journey from the valleys of woundedness, of, of the brokenness, of the sin, and the mess that we make for ourselves, to the peaks of wholeness. So from the valleys to the peaks of wholeness, but it usually requires a layover in the desert plains of the wilderness. And this is what I want to unpack for us today. The wilderness stops on the way to wholeness. We don't stop in the wilderness. Jesus never stayed in the wilderness when he was led by the Spirit to go in the wilderness. The wilderness is always temporary. Say temporary. Look at the person beside you and say, are you paying attention? Go ahead. I had you to say something because I needed water. I'm kind of thirsty. Glad you're paying attention. So we return to the story of Moses, and it will be like a roadmap for us. And so, and, and we'll see this in Exodus chapter 5, verse 22 to 23. This is like a mid-course correction. So 
in that scripture. In fact, uh, Andy, if you want to throw that up there, we'll look at Exodus 5, verse 22 to 23. And so when you're on a flight, you're always going to have adjustments on that flight. If you're ever, I piloted once. I drove a plane by myself once. I did. I did once. Don't tell the aviation authorities. I didn't have a pilot's license, nothing, but I had a friend who had a plane and he gave me the, whoa. It always was adjusting to the correction, to the, everything that, I didn't even know how to describe what I was doing. I was just flying. <laughs> but every good pilot knows that there's always mid-flight course correction. Sometimes because of weather, sometimes because of the wind, sometimes for whatever reason. Exodus 5, this story is a bit of a mid-flight course correction for the people of Israel. So when Moses returned to the Lord and said, Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? Why is it that you have sent me? He's got all these questions. For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he, Pharaoh, has done evil to this people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. So Pharaoh's on them. They haven't been delivered. He's got the promise. They're to, they're to be delivered. And we look at this and we, we, these difficult in-between places between the promise given and the promise received. For all of us, God's given you many promises. It's the middle, it's that mid-flight that we get, that we feel is most difficult, that season between receipt of the promise and the completion of that promise. And it seems like it's the hardest challenge, just where so many people just give up because they feel like that's not gonna happen for me. God speaks to you about something, about your kids, about your future, about your finances, about whatever it may be, and you trust that that's a promise, and then you kind of give up mid-flight. Mid ah, God's saying mid-course correction. Let's just get back on track. And we often skip over scriptures like this one in Exodus because when we read it, we are just assuming, here's Moses complaining. He's just, he's just a complainer right here. He's just, he's just, I won't say what I was thinking, He's just not having a good day. He's complaining. He's doubting maybe. Like what's going on with Moses? What is he really thinking? Only when you read this in the context of the whole story, when I read the text, you know and I know, we know the full story. We know he makes it to the promised land. We actually probably know that before we even know these parts of the scripture that we don't really read very much. So we go, oh, Moses, come on, what are you doing? He's gonna get to the promised land. And so why is all this middle, this middle mid-flight conversations recorded in the Bible? It's because we need them. We need to know what God says to his servants, to his people, to his followers. Because I'll tell you right now, when I read this today, in that moment, in the moment that Moses was in, he was not in the promised land yet. All he had was A, number one, a promise. So he's in his bag. All he's got in his baggage is a promise, and he's got his current circumstances. That's all he has. He doesn't have the fulfillment. So what is, he's on a journey. He's packed a promise, and he's got his current circumstances. That is all. And his cer certain circumstances were not good at all. It was a rough, rough time for the people of Israel. In fact, remember, they were kept on saying, it'd be better for us if we go back to Egypt. The slave mentality in them did not see the freedom that was in front of them. And they thought, I'd rather be a slave. At least I got leeks and onions. Or leaky onions. I'm not sure where they are. So they'd rather have bondage, baggage, with what they were familiar with as opposed to the freedom that God had promised them because they couldn't see it yet. They had the promise and they're certain. And don't, get, don't go looking at Moses and the people of Israel like, man, those guys, they should have pulled themselves together. They should have thought better. Guaranteed, if you were in that circumstance, when you can't see the fulfillment, you could, I heard you complain before. <laughs> I heard some of you, I've heard you loud and clear, a few of you. Not, not gonna point to any elbows or nothing. The reality is we all do that. My wife hears me complaining. So oh, you, you, you complain. Listen, there's stuff that happens. And how many people know we, we live normal lives? She has to put up with a lot. I'll be honest with you. 
I'm not OCD. I'm not. I don't have ADHD. Although I went for a job interview once, and the first thing said, are you on medication for ADHD? It was like a question in interview. It wasn't at Bethany, thank God. So just like us, all of us, we have a promise. We have a promise from God, and the Bible is full. If you don't have a promise from God, the Bible is full of them. There are, are many promises for you to hang on to, to claim, to declare, to believe, to trust, to hold on to the promises of God. There are many. If you need one, I'm sure for whatever circumstance you're in, there is an answer for you. And we have our current situation. My encouragement to you today is not to be thrown off by the critical voices of others as well. The complaining that might happen around you, the judgmental side of some people that want to judge you or criticize you or condemn you because you haven't got it together yet or you're not there yet. We all do that. We all go through that too, where others look at us. Listen, my friend, run your race. You're not running their race. You know, you know, speak to the hand. If someone's complaining to you and they want to give you all their spiritual advice about how you're supposed to run your race. You know the difference between a guest and a pest? The invitation. Seriously. Some of you need to stop pestering people and just pray for them. If they invite you as a guest, feel free to unload all your wonderful advice. Seriously. And stop bugging people. In your mind, oh, I got so many stories I could tell you, but I don't have time. Run your race and don't let, and most importantly, don't let fear or worries or the tangible baggage of today, as real as it may feel for you, those things that weigh you down today, deter you from knowing that God can and God will bring you through. He will bring you to as well. I, I'm speaking to some parents right now. Some of you are hanging on for dear life on, on hope, hope and a prayer for your kids. Good. God's got them too. And he can and he will do his will for them. In Jesus' name. And he will bring you through to shalom, to wholeness. I, God's not finished with me yet. I don't know if anybody's here, God's finished with you. Guarantee he's not. Because you still have a pulse, he's not finished with you. If we're, if we're going to your funeral, he was finished. Everybody's looking pretty alive today. This is awesome. He's not finished with you yet. He has more for you than you know. Oh, Holy Spirit's on this moment right now. Father, shake, shake some hearts right now that this is so true for them. This is not just for the church. This is for individuals here. God's not done with you yet. I have a friend who is a pastor who's not pastoring because of circumstances in his church and he kind of got the left foot of fellowship. Not a good situation. Good guy, good pastor. I sent him a text this week, I said. I said, and actually, Lord spoke to me to send it to a couple other people who were not in, not in full-time pastoring ministry that just because you're not pastoring doesn't mean you're not a pastor. He needed to hear that. And I sent it to somebody in this church too and responded back, needed to hear that. It's because the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. They're even without repentance. So if you're a knucklehead and you've, you're, you're, you're not pursuing glory and you're messed up in some sin, whew, even without repentance, the gifts and callings of God are, are irrevocable. So he's going to bring you to shalom. He's going to bring you to wholeness. You need to just get back on the flight, try to open, you know, instead of trying to open the door of that jet midstream and say, I don't, I don't want to go there anymore. That's not a good idea. You get arrested, by the way, in real life. That happened this week. I'm preparing this message. Oh, a guy gets arrested in Vancouver for trying to open the door mid-flight. Aren't you glad you weren't on that flight? He knows the end of your story too. And I believe we will look back and yes, we will have scars, but we'll have stories. We will see what God has, that God was with us the whole time. Where were you, God? 
He was with you the whole time. My scars tell story. I got a number of scars. I got a scar on my left eye from a spike that went in my in construction. I still got this. It was perfect when I was a youth pastor and freaked out the junior high kids because I stare at them with my weird eye. And they, they were like, they didn't know what to do because they thought I was looking right through them, which I wasn't, but it felt like I should because I knew they were junior high. <laughs> I have a scar here from when I had surgery to remove everything that was going crazy in here at one point in time. And I got, still got the scar, still snag it when I s- shave sometimes. And sometimes like a little electric, because they, they had a cut around the nerve that makes me smile. Can you imagine that? Nice doc. Whew. So for a year, was it almost a year, honey? I had no smile. Can you imagine that, not having a smile for a year? So I was like, eh, how's it going? <laughs> I'm so happy. I was like, for about a year. It was, it was weird. So I have that, I have scars to tell, and scars tell stories. And we have a scar, a physical scar in your body somewhere. You probably got a story to tell about it. You're, you're a knucklehead riding a bike down the hill without a helmet. <laughs> right? That's you. I got it. So if my scars tell a story, your scars tell a story, but also the reminders that life tried to break you and failed. These are markings where I was wounded but also where my testimony was welded to me. He is so faithful, is he not? So what did Moses do? Let's go back to the verse in Exodus, chapter five, verse 22. I wanna just highlight the first part of that. We read it earlier. So Moses, what did he do? Returned to the Lord. And if we read it now differently, he's not really complaining. These are real questions. And it's okay to question God. It's okay to be angry at God. It's okay to be upset and frustrated. And this is what Moses was doing. Pointing a staff in the air. God, what's going on? But the key was he returned to the Lord. That's all God's asking you to do is return to him. And he's going to welcome you with arms wide open, right? He demonstrated that on the cross. That's how much he loves you. Arms wide open. So come. So Moses returned to him. And even though Pharaoh and God hadn't completely different, Pharaoh was still impacting their minds, their mentality, slave mentality, and God had not completely delivered them. So let me pose this question to you. What if we related the gospel to people on the basis of how awesome they could possibly be in Christ more than how awful or how screwed up they are without him? What if we reverse the evangelism and say, you rotten, dirty sinners, and you, you light matches and, whoosh, and you throw a match at them, and burnt, hot, hell's hotter than this. That's an evangelism tactic, apparently. Wooden sticks, so they burn longer. <laughs> Happened to me. I saw it. I witnessed it. Whoosh. Hell's hotter than this. Turn or burn. I, did anybody get saved like that in this church? Because there might be a few churches that that works. But the reality is, rather than say how awful people are, what about this is who you could be in Christ? This is how awesome things could be in Christ. Of course, we must tell them the whole gospel that human beings have been totaled by the effects of sin. I'm not, I just read earlier, for the wages of sin is death and all have fallen short of the glory of God. But rather than just being totaled by the effects of sin, that our best efforts fall and our best efforts fall miserably short of the glory of God. So the gold is the glory of God. But don't stop there. Tell them they're made in the image of God and that the Father is calling their hearts to him. And the Father sent Jesus to restore that image in us. And listen to this. Make us new. I hear you make us. You make all things new. So what do you think of that? That approach. Because we all want easy answers. It's easy to say, you're going to hell. Then rather than walk alongside somebody and say, hey, let me show you how awesome you could be in Christ. Real discipleship is not easy. And it takes time and commitment and love to walk with people. And we always want quick fixes to get past our 
you know, our remedies. You know, we, we just want a remedy. We want a pill. We want this. We want a doctor to fix me. I went to how many doctors, honey? I got a thumb in a, in a thing, whatever this thing is. And uh, how many people love waiting in emergency and doctors at walk-ins? I went from walk-in to emergency to clinic to diagnostic to how many people love those days? My mom texted me, how did, you, how did you hurt your thumb? Here's the lame answer back. I don't know. <laughs> she goes, wow. <laughs> Hi, mom. So my experience is that the road to healing is not always fast, but it is what God wills. He does want to bring you to a place of shalom and wholeness in Jesus. And the road to healing is complex. Don't, don't get me wrong. It, there's a lot of complexities. And it requires learning and it requires some grunt work. So I'm just sticking to it. Just hold on. And my experience, not as a pastor, but as a human being, is it should give you some credence and maybe some confidence of how God, who has helped me understand how wholeness involves a healing journey of body, mind, and soul. That's the, that's the whole purpose of God. He doesn't just want to heal your spirits. If he just want to heal your spirits, and if, if, if the goal was just to get you to heaven, then you'd accept Christ and then he'd kill you. So you'd go to heaven. That's not the goal of God, right? Say the sinner's prayer, I'm born again. Adios. Sends an angel and lasso and yank you into heaven. The goal is not to get you into heaven, it's to get heaven here. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So until we get to heaven, we've got some healing work to do. True? All right. We also need to recognize how habitual habits, the, the things, we, the habitual habits, the habitual ways that we have of observing, interpreting life, what we go through can actually hinder our growth. I'll just touch on this briefly. Your personal worldview is important, how you see God, because it's the filter of how you navigate all of your life experiences. If you know that God is good and the ultimately God wants to bring you to goodness and wholeness, then you're gonna have a good worldview of the process that you're going through. If you think at the end of the days, good luck. I have no idea. Hope you make it. Hang on, brother. How goes the battle? Ah, oh, he didn't do too well. No, no, no. If you've got a mentality is that you're not sure that God's got his best intentions for you to bring you to a, the goodness of God is one of the greatest revelations you need. That he's always going to be good for you and bring you into that place of goodness. Amen. I'll give you a quick illustration. I, uh, one of the issues in my life, and I, didn't, I kind of was unaware of it. And in just this week, it was brought back to my attention when I was in my church renewal mentoring session. It just, the Lord reminded me of something that I had been, that I have had to deal with that sometimes sticks up its ugly head from time to time. And you might not think this, but I never wanted to talk in public. And he said, this guy doesn't want to stop talking in public. <laughs> that wasn't always the case. English class, how to do an oral report, book report. I was so scared, I leaned against the blackboard, chalkboard, and my sweaty back, and give I sat down in Mr. De Beers' class, and on the back of the blackboard, everybody's laughing, was a sweaty back print. I was sweating like a crazy man. Chalk walking through the hallways, I couldn't get the chalk off. It's, it's Seriously, I never wanted to be in front of people talking. And you're finding that really hard to believe. But inferiority plagued my life. It wasn't that I couldn't speak up in front of an English class, but I felt inferior. And I still feel that way sometimes around certain pastors. I feel inferior. Like, whoa, they're a man of God. And then I get to know them and go, they're an idiot too. Not you, brother. I, 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 I don't know you enough yet. We're, we're working on it. Sorry. 
Forgive me, that was, that was not proper. So I had negative beliefs and assumptions about myself that were in me. I didn't really see myself in Christ, the way God wanted to heal me, restore me, to bring me to wholeness. I had to deal with inferiority that God would do for me what, what he needed to do. And I just didn't think I was the candidate. I felt like I wasn't worthy for that. So coming to a place of an encounter with God in a healing, in a healing encounter and just sob, just Kleenex boxes worth just weeping, Sonia, you, you saw that. It's in Bogota, Colombia, and God just broke that inferiority complex. Just like a, you heard of rivers of living water? The rivers of living water. Just crying and snotting and just healing. Healing snot. I'm, I'm not kidding. It was amazing. I, I, I didn't look good, but I, it was amazing what was going on inside. And we cannot do that without self-awareness. So let me take you on the journey now, back to Deuteronomy 10. And we're, this is where we're going to, this is where the flight goes. So verse 6, we're going to talk about verse 6. The, inter, it, the itinerary, that, that the mid-course correction, Exodus 5, now helps us understand verse 6 of Deuteronomy 10. So the first destination and we'll put on there, is B'nai Jachin. So the people of Israel got, Moses was taking the people to, and this is called the primal, the definition of this primal wells. Those things that are primal within us. God is ever patiently working within us to heal us, and he's taking all the necessary things in us to free us, to un, unpack the wells, because stones were thrown into these wells. The Philistines came and filled those wells with stones so the water could not be reached. And God wants to take all that hardness, those hard-hearted, stony hearts out of us. If he wants to heal us, first thing he's going to do is, if, today if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. So that's what B'nai Jachin means. It's a primal wells where the shadows of the hardness of the stones that were thrown there. And like Jesus at the well with the Samaritan woman, you know that story, by the Spirit on the Father's behalf, Jesus continually works in us like he did in this woman to strip away shame and false pretense. He's delivering us from the fear of rejection. He's delivering us from invisibility. And he labors to bring us face to face with, our, with our, his with with the glorious Father which is in heaven, in whom there is no shadow of turn. There's no shadows with God. And the second destination that he brings us to is a place called Mosera, means correction. So once you deal with a hard heart, you say, Lord, heal my hard heart, deliver me from this hard heart. He then, you give him permission to correct you. How do we stay strong in the spirit? Well, first of all, we need the word of God. All of us, we need, we cannot grow and we cannot be all that God's called us to be without the word of God. The word of God is food that you need for your spirit. Without the word of God, you will be weak. You will not be able to receive correction. You'll reject correction if you're not strong. To stay strong in your spirit is the goal so that you can receive the correction because the word of God is here to instruct us, to correct us, right? All the things that it's intended to do. You see, when I'm thirsty, actually, I'm thirsty again right now. Give me a second. Wow. Wow. I quenched that thirst quite well. Some of you want some right now, right? When I'm thirsty, I drink. When I'm thirsty and I drink water, it quenches that thirst. Can I tell you, just like you need to be hungry for the word, for food, you need to be thirsty for his presence. You need to crave being thirst for the presence of the living God. So you take the word of God and the word of God that goes forth, you know, it goes forth on Sundays, it goes forth in your quiet time, different ways that you hear the word of God. They're inspired. The word of God is inspired. Wednesday, I had a great chat with Cheryl Bridges Johns. She just talked about the word is alive, where the spirit infused the word. I was like, I was like, I have no idea what she's talking about. She's talking like way ahead, educational, intellectually, like whew, up here for me. And I'm just going, yes. But my spirit was going, yes. Because the word of God is life, is water to your thirsty souls. 
The Bible itself is inherent with power. It's filled with power. You cannot make this journey to wholeness without the word of God being a power in your life to deliver you, to set you free. Just like you eat food, you chew it and you swallow on it. That's what meditation means, is to to chew and to swallow and regurgitate and chew it again and swallow. That's what meditate actually means, the word of the Lord. Now, because you need the nutrition that it offers you to be released in you. I wish fries had nutrition. Chips. Kale. I guarantee the kale salesman, they said, let's put it in chip form. Well, hopefully people will buy it. Have you had kale chips? It's, it's like... You had? It's like chewing pesticides. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it. No, I don't care if it's good for you. Crazy. And cranberry, it's getting into everything. It's an apple, cran apple, raspberry cran. The cranberry salespeople, they knew what they were doing. But kale. You, you need the word and you need the nutrients it brings you so that you have life. If only the word that you have and you listen for these 40 minutes and you're even attentive, if this is the only time, listen to me carefully, the only time that you're hearing the word of God and you are hearing the word of God and it is bringing life to you, but if it's the only thing, then you're gonna be malnourished because you need more than a preacher. You need you. You need to be your best preacher. You need to be talking to yourself about the word. You need to be reading it, memorizing it, meditating on it so that the correction, because I'll tell you, I got one sermon and there's like a whole bunch of you, if God's gonna bring correction to you, I, got in the, I need 150 sermons on correction, whatever it might be. So you need to read the word so that God can correct you so you can get to your destination of wholeness because you can't get to the next place without Masera. Let me go to the next thing. The word of God, I could talk about that all day right there. The word of God is so powerful. And you need the sacred text. And you need to come thirsty. You need to come excited even to church. You need to come and realize what a precious treasure it is to worship together with other believers, to to have their anointing on their life near you as you're worshiping and your anointing on your life so they can be impacted. And then you hear the word of God together because God is with you and with us together. That correction brings you then in that Moshera is repentance then. is because when the presence of God and the word of God comes, then we have to repent. So the journey of correction begins with repentance. And you know, the things that keep us weak in spirit is hidden sin. Those things that we need to repent of and the stuff that we push aside. Brings us to the third destination. And this is a place called Gadgota, which is literally means the slashing place. This is where you get pruned. Where God's saying, okay, you know that baggage you thought was really nice? I don't care if it was Gucci. Prada. Am I making that good? Yeah, honey? Snap. Not that she has any, but we look, we window shop. The reality is there are things that we think we need to bring along on this journey and God's saying, No. So the slashing place is a place where your mindsets, where God wants to minimize negative mindsets, where he wants to cut off that that bad thing. This is about our thoughts mostly. And a thorough explanation of this would be somehow realizing how our thoughts influence us, how our feelings, while acknowledging, listen to me carefully, while acknowledging how Satan affects our thoughts, what really tripped up Israel was they thought they were grasshoppers when they saw the giants. It was their slave mentality. Satan wasn't even involved in that. They saw themselves like grasshoppers. They had an inferiority complex. Because when they scouted the promised land, they saw giants. 10 of them came back with a negative report. So that negativity had to be cut out of them. The slave mindset that continued to upend their progress. 
because it was, Israel's problem wasn't the giants. They could conquer the giants, but what they couldn't conquer were the grasshoppers in their minds. So some things need to be cut out of our lives, that slave mentality. Bring that to the Lord. In repentance, bring that to the Lord. Lord, what are the mentalities that I have that need to be cut out of my life? Brings us to the fourth destination before we enter the, the promised land. And this fourth destination is called Yotbatha. I said Jot before, but it's Yotbatha. It means pleasant emotions. That's a cool name. So it's not all tough. It's not all correction. It's not all pruning. It's not all getting all the hard heart. Sometimes it's, it's an oasis. We need these re times of respite. Land filled with streams of water, it says in your Bible, an oasis where we sojourn and where we tire. Listen, John chapter four, verse six, even Jesus on his journey got tired. Look at this scripture here. Jacob's well was there and Jesus, watch this, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well because it was about noon or it was lunchtime. Even the son of God get tired. How many people find that really hard? They, Jesus got tired. If Jesus got tired, he was jet lagged from his journey. If Jesus got tired, how many people know you will probably get tired and you need refreshing oasis? So don't dismiss your feelings as irrelevant. And this is what happens in some churches is, is that by not listening to your bodies means dismissing one of the truths most, one of the most things that you could trust the most is your body's telling you something. Our bodies often try to tell us that we're stressed out, how stressed we are. Our bodies tell us. So don't dismiss your emotions. Don't dismiss your bodies. Your bodies are telling you you're overworked. You're frustrated. You're angry. You're burned out. How tired you are. Don't ignore these messages. To ignore the voice of truth, the voice of the spirit that calls us to shalom. You cannot, I don't see you. I don't feel you. I don't know that I've got problems. To find for a toddler, but if you want to walk into wholeness, you've got to realize, you've got to see the reality around you, including your own body. I went five days without going to the doctor because I'm like a typical guy. Oh man, it, oh man, I'll, I'll get through it. It's just, it's just a f flesh wound. It's just, I got, bru I got a bruise. I don't know what I got. And when it gets worse and worse and worse, some people know, go to the hospital. I couldn't even carry, I couldn't even carry my Bible. I still was kind of like tender. Like what's wrong with me? So when your body's telling you something, something's wrong. Would you agree with that? And the enemy works at affecting our thinking, affecting our emotions. Don't get me wrong. He does that. We're most vulnerable when we don't let he works this way. But let me, let me, let me land in Shalom. Let me land this flight. If you ever hear of a teaching in a church that perpetuates negative beliefs or false assumptions about our emotions and feelings that are critical of it, we're not led by our emotions, but please, God gave you a mind, will, emotions. They're gifts to us, to tell us, warning us, letting us know. I want to pray for you based on the scripture I'm going to put on the screen. I'm going to pray that the promised land of Shalom finds you ready to receive your reward. You're willing to, to go through. And as Hebrews 4, verse 1 and 3, although God's promise still stands, like he did, he gave Moses a promise. He's giving you promise. The promise still stands. His promise that all may enter his place of Shalom. It's more than rest. Most translations say rest. We ought to tremble with fear because some of you may be on the verge of failing to get there after all. For this wonderful news, the message of God that God wants to save us has been given to us just as it was to those who lived in the time of Moses. But it didn't do them any good because they didn't believe it. They didn't mix it with faith. They didn't mix the promise received with faith, the determination to hang on to what God says. I have faith in what God says. They didn't hang on to it with faith. Verse three, for only we who believe God 
can enter into or experience, other translations say, experience his destination of shalom. Isn't that beautiful? So you're, you're going to arrive there. How do you arrive there? Just faith in God's promises for you. And let him pull out those hard heart, hard-hearted hearts and let him prune away and bring correction. Go ahead, repentance. Do it every day. Repent every day. Come on, I, I got to repent every day. You know what you should do? It's just every day we wake up, okay, God, what do we need to repent of? Because if there's stuff that's messing up your walk with him from entering what he has, just, just change your way of thinking. Just repent. Get it right with God. Father, this is our prayer. We're going we're gonna to receive that promise. We're going to enter into the destination that you've called us to. We're willing to cut off that baggage, that weight, the stuff, even things that might seem good. They're just not part of the journey where we're going. They're, they're just not part of our future. So we're willing to let it all go because, Father, we want to receive. And so give us faith, your faith, your kind of faith, to hang on to every promise for our lives and that we as a people would enter into wholeness, into shalom, into peace, completeness, in Jesus' name. He wants to bring you into the goodness of God. Who wants that? As I was preaching, I received a text from a pastor. He starts by saying, man, moving on is easy in principle, but seeing my daughter cry and just shut down, going to a new church is painful. She doesn't want to be here, just wants to go back to the way it was. It's not just people who are struggling to find home, find their place. Pastors, ministers, evangelists, we are all on this journey together to be led to the healing that God has want, especially I know this family situation. Wholeness that's calling them forward. And I believe that there'd be many of you here that have great need in that as well. And so I want to pray as we close that God is calling you to a place of wholeness and goodness in him. So with a heart surrendered to him, let's just pray. Lord, here we are together, your people. Thank you that you have called us forward out of our past, through our current circumstance, to a place of promise. And it looks different for all of us, but Lord, it is not an easy journey without you, without your spirit. And as, a, as families specifically, Lord, as we try to navigate this season, this painful season in so many, so many ways, we just pray, Lord, that you give us a supernatural grace and the courage and the faith it takes just to hold on to your promise, even for our kids. We pray, Lord, that you would just bless your people this day. And may the Spirit of the Lord guide us and lead us, and may we continue to be hungry and thirsty for your word knowing that you've got good things for us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I got a quick little uh, let you know before, I, before you go is um, tax receipts are available. If you need your tax receipts from the church, yay. Uh, they're in your mailboxes. If you don't have a mailbox, uh, contact the office. It's put in the postal mail for delivery. If you don't have a mailbox, looks like that's also the case. So the finance team, let's give it up for our church's finance team. They're amazing. Yeah. And so make sure you pick up your tax receipts. And before you go, high five at least two people or hug at least one person, all right? That, that's the plan. God bless you as you go today.